All right. Well, without further ado, so you already got to hear from Professor Litton, Professor Ryan yesterday. Hey, you're, you're not escaping that. Sure, so, sure, you know. sure. Um, but yes, I hope you enjoyed him preaching. Today he's going to teach. Uh, I've heard him do both. I've enjoyed both. I've learned from both, and I'm sure you're going to do the same. So I just want to open us in prayer. And then, uh, Ryan, the class is yours. Okay. So, Father, we love you so much, and we thank you for the joy of uh, being with the body of Christ. God, thank you for bringing Ryan to us. Thank you for his willingness to share uh, what he's mined out of your word. I pray that you bless our hour together. Let it be fruitful and go to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for, for having me here. Like I said in chapel, whenever somebody has you back, you know you didn't blow it, right? So it's just... It's fun to get invited back. Um, this has just been a lot of fun. Like we've we've really loved the trip. Justin and I. This is our second time. But then Scott and Lena. Like we just we just love this place. It's a lot of fun. Um, Justin asked, and so I will I will be nice and do what Justin asked me to do. We have info cards. We would love to connect with you if you want to like give us your info so we can connect with you about our school. Uh, we'd love for you to fill one of those out. And uh, I'm not the sales guy, so like I'm not gonna go into any more detail on that. So we have info cards. Fill out an info card. That'd be great. Okay, let's talk about Jesus. Um, so <laughs> uh, uh, when Nick sent me like what he's, what, where, where you guys are at in the course thus far, um, the thing that mainly stuck out to me was what we can know of God, right? God transcends us. And so what does it mean to talk about our ability to know God? Because ultimately like we, we can't know God in one sense, right? I mean, I kind of alluded to this at the beginning of my sermon yesterday that like there are times in worship, I think we've probably all been there, where you sort of feel like there's nothing I can say right now that is worth saying, right? Like nothing I can say is really worthy of God. And so I'd rather just like stay silent than, than you know, say anything because it's just not good enough, right? Um, and, and so that feeling of like, what I say isn't quite good enough for God, um, that is a very distinct approach to theology. And so this big fancy word right here, apophatic, right, um, is a, an approach to theology that's also called sometimes negative theology. Basically how this works is um, if we were to take a box, right, I know we're not supposed to put God inside of a box, but let's put God inside of a box. Um, what, what would we say about God? What would we say God is? Holy. Right? Yeah. God's holy. Merciful. Yeah. Merciful. Just. Forgiving, loving. I, I did this one time and um, the students were having a really hard time coming up with things to say. And then out of nowhere, one of them was like, Waymaker, Miracle Worker. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, there you go. Like, that's like, there's a whole list of things that God is, right? Like, there you go, right? That's not cheating. That's just creative thinking, right? Um, so this, this would be what we would call codifotic or positive theology. This is when we say... Um, God is whatever, right? And there are times, no matter what we put in this box, like there are times where we feel like no matter what that word is, it's just not enough, right? Um, I married way outside of my league, um, which I think is a common experience for guys, right? We tend to marry up. Um, like you see the wife and then you see the husband and you're like, were, were you on something? Like, what did he, like, how did that happen, right? And if you meet my wife, it'd be like, yeah, yeah, you, there, something happened there that is not normal. Um, and uh, my wife has a, uh, has a tattoo on the back of her neck that is the Hebrew word for beautiful. And it's because the way that I um, finally convinced her to pay attention to me is uh, um, we had the whole, like, you know, uh, I think this is more than friends. And she's like, no, it's not. And then like a few weeks later, I was like, I think this is more than friends. And she's like, no, it's not. And, but then like in between those, she kept like asking me to go like do these like not friend things. Like, 
spending like very like unique time just the two of us and I'm like and so one day I was like I was like look like I get that you say that this this isn't more than friends but it really feels like that to me and she said uh I just have a really hard time believing that someone likes me that much and I said I can tell you that you're beautiful in five different languages and none of them are good enough um and that was the moment where she was like and I was like oh finally won right like yeah yeah but it's that feeling right where you're like, the, the language that I have isn't enough, right? Like, to say that God is holy, like, what does that even mean, right? Like, that it just isn't enough for me to say that he's holy, because he's holier than the word holy, right? Like, it just isn't, it isn't enough. And so, apophatic theology is outside of this box, right? Apophatic, or also sometimes called uh, negative theology, and so apophatic theology initially is to say it's, it's not quite good enough to say that God is loving because, like, I love pizza, right? Like, those are not, like, I really love pizza, but still, like, those are just not in the same category. And so it's potentially, you know, in, in an apophatic approach, it's potentially more accurate to say God is not hateful, right? Because the word loving feels like it's not quite good enough, but whatever we want to say about God, we know that this isn't true of him, right? And so apophatic theology is sort of like, well, we don't feel conf confident about what we're saying about God, so let's say what we don't believe about him, right? And this is how, like, uh, early church theology develops a lot of the time, because you have a heretic who's like, you know, Jesus is so God that he's not really man, and all the Orthodox Christians are like, no, right? <laughs> and, and when they hear the inappropriate uh, expression of the gospel, they have to start thinking through what the gospel actually is, and so they end up having to define it's not this, it is this, right? Um, but they don't start with it is this, right? They hear the wrong thing first and say, no, not that. And from that, they have to determine, like, it, it is this, right? It's like with the canon, right? Early Christians weren't particularly concerned with which books were in and which books were out until Marcion was like, the Old Testament's out, right? <laughs> and everybody was like, no. <laughs> And, and then he's like, okay, well, what's in? And they're like, we don't know, but you're wrong. Like, <laughs> we haven't really decided completely yet, but, like, it's not that, right? And so then they have to kind of figure that out, right? Um, so this is, this is codophotic, apophotic theology, right? Um, I'm, I'm going to erase this. Is this going to give anybody a panic, panic attack if I erase this? Okay. Sometimes I write stuff on the board and I go to erase it and people are like, <gasps> I, I haven't finished writing that down yet. And you're like, yeah, okay. Um, okay, so... One of the ways that we can think about that that's really helpful is when we think about the Trinity, there, there are at least two different ways that we can think about the Trinity. Um, there's the imminent Trinity, and there's the economic Trinity, okay? And this doesn't mean that there are two Trinities, okay? doesn't mean there are two different ways of looking at it, okay? The imminent trinity is what we would say uh, God as he is um, and understand that he there is, I mean, it's anthropomorphic, right? We don't think that God is gendered, um, but, you know, God as God is, I guess we could say. Um, we have Father, Son, and, and Holy Spirit, and all of them are divine but they're distinct from one another. So the Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Father is not the Holy Spirit. The Son is not the Father, right? This is the Trinity as it, as it exists. And the difficulty in apophaticism or codophaticism is knowing this, God as he is. God at his very nature, at his very, the very center of his being, right? 
economic trinity is <coughs> God as he does. Or God in his actions, God in his activity, God as he is revealed, that sort of thing, right? <coughs> Here, this, this is, we can know this, right? Because God's telling us, right? There's revelation here. And so when God says, I am this, we can say like, okay, well, he is that, right? Um, we can know this. The difficulty is what is the relationship between these two things, right? Um, now, hopefully we believe that uh, the economic trinity is a meaningful revelation of the, uh, the imminent trinity, right? Because otherwise, like God's playing a game on us, right? Um, but there is a challenge there of like, he's revealed himself, but do I know him as he is, right? You guys kind of grappling with this? Does this kind of make sense? Um, one of my, um, my favorite quotes related to this is St. Augustine in one of his sermons. He says this in a sermon. Appreciate that he says this in a sermon. When you read ancient sermons, you feel really bad about your preaching, right? Because you're like, I... I don't do that, right? <laughs> like, I don't say anything like that. Uh, he said, and, and it's, it's uh, really hard to put it in English in the way that he says it in Latin. He, in Latin, he says, Sic comprendus nonus Deus, which is just like really terse. It's like really like, <laughs> right? And in English, that means uh, if you comprehend it, that thing is not God, right? And what he's trying to get at is he's like, if you've gotten to a point where you're like, I get it. Whatever it is, is not God. You do not get him, right? You're never going to get to that point. Well, he goes on to continue that metaphor and says, uh, in the same way that your eye cannot comprehend light, right? If you stare at the sun, bad things will happen to you, right? Um, in the same way that your eye cannot comprehend all of light, your mind cannot comprehend all of God, but your eye can understand some of light, so your mind can understand some of God, right? Like, I think he does a really good job there of playing with, like, we can't get him, but we can, right? <laughs> like, and he uses two different words there. He uses comprehend and understand, right? We can't comprehend God. We can't get to a point where we're like, I got it but we can understand him to a degree, right? Does that make sense? You guys tracking here? Um, and so this, this is a, a helpful distinction. This um, solves for us uh, some Christological problems. Um, and uh, I don't know, I may, I may be like making an enemy here because I don't know where you stand on like the whole eternal subordination of the sun and that whole fracas that happened. But if you're using bird, I'm assuming we agree because... I, I agree with Bird. Um, Bird is my doctoral supervisor, by the way, so I'm like really geeked out that you guys are using his book. He's he's a lot of fun. Um, he's also like just a hyper genius. Like it's like it's ridiculous the amount of stuff this guy knows. Like just off the top of his head. Uh, I was, we were in a doctoral seminar and there was a guy that was presenting on Epictetus, who is like a Greco-Roman rhetorician, who has like nothing to do with the New Testament really. And this guy's presenting, and he says something, and Bird's like, that's not true. And I'm like, you just, you're just like reading Epictetus for your devos the other day? Like, you just like casually just know that? Um, so in, in the economic trinity, the, the issue that it solves for us is um, the, the relationship here, right? Um, because in the economy of salvation, the son is divine, right, just as he is in the imminent trinity, but the Son also becomes human, right? And so how, do, how does the incarnation impact the Father-Son relationship? And there are some that say that the subordination of the Son, because there is pretty clearly in like the Gospel of John, times where the Son talks about obeying the Father, right? Like that's pretty clear. The question is, is the obedience of the Son, is it a part of the incarnation, or is it a part of God as he is? 
And so there's this whole debate about the eternal subordination of the Son, about is, is this a part of God as he is? Is there a hierarchy within the Trinity where like the Father is like the most God and the Son and the Spirit just sort of like come from him, right? And are like, you know, subservient to him? Or are they perfectly equal to one another and uh, the Son's subordination to the Father is a function of his incarnation, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I would say, because I agree with Bird, that his subordination to the Father is a function of the Incarnation, right? That when he, when he becomes human, um, in his humanity, he is subordinated to the Father, right? Because humans aren't equal to God, right? Now, that doesn't mean that he ceases to be God. Uh, he he puts, puts a priority on his humanity, is something we might say, right? Like, he continues to be God. He's always God. Um, and for, for the rest of eternity, he's still human, right? He's the anchor of hope, uh, Hebrews says. And so his humanity is the anchor of our hope. If he stops being human, we stop being saved, right? Um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, his subordination to the Father is him being the second Adam. It's him being the, the human who says, I'm going to do the right thing as opposed to doing my own thing, Right? Um, that sort of thing. And so, so this, this is a helpful distinction in, I mean, I, I've, I've even had this conversation with some friends of mine that I, we, we get together every couple of weeks and talk through all of our sermons, right? We do sermon prep together. And we actually got into this in sermon prep one day about like, is the son eternally subordinated to the father or is he only subordinated to the father from the incarnation forward? Because that actually like impacts what you understand about Jesus, how you present Jesus, what, what the gospel even is, right? Like it impacts all sorts of different things, right? And, uh, and so this actually like actually came up one time. Um, so apophaticism from that. <laughs> what, what can we know of God? What does it mean to know God? What does it mean to know something of God? Well, um, I, I wrote a paper that uh, is being published um, that... I sent to Nick, and he was like, yeah, this is on topic, so, so we can talk about it. And, uh, and in the paper, I argue that uh, glossolalia, do you guys know what glossolalia is? You guys know that word? Uh, speaking in tongues. Yeah, that's like the fancy word for speaking in tongues, right? Um, and so, uh, shandala, shandala, right? Um, and so, <laughs> uh, what is it? Un- untie my bow tie, who stole my Honda? Right, like that's the like, the the joke of like you know how to how to pray in tongues. Uh, I had a friend one time who he's from uh, Iran, um, and uh, he went to a Pentecostal church and they were praying for him to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they were trying to get him to like repeat after them as they prayed in tongues because they wanted him to pray in tongues, and he was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to start speaking Farsi because they won't know the difference, right? And he's he went to start speaking Farsi and started speaking in tongues. <laughs> it's just like, yep, yeah, that's like God does weird stuff like that. Um, so my argument in the paper is that glossolalia, speaking in tongues, is actually apophatic in nature. Uh, and I'll, I'll unpack that in a minute. Um, I, I have this URL here, bit.ly slash LPUVA at Summit. If you want to download the PowerPoint presentation, you can using that link. Um, and so uh, if you want to you see... Uh, what I'm working with there, you can. Uh, the image I have here is from like a, it's an engraving from an old Bible, and this is Latin for eye has not seen, nor has ear heard. Um, that same kind of idea of like God is like above and beyond us, you know, um, that, that we, don't, we don't think of things the same way that he does. If you've ever wanted to see an abstract for a paper, this is an abstract. A lot of fun to write. There's so much fun, yeah. You have to summarize your entire research in like a paragraph, and it's like, really painful. I hated it. Anyway, so I put it in there because I was like, you want to know what an abstract looks like? There you go. Um, So there's this quote from Cicero that I started out with in the paper that I think is really helpful. He says, a wise man never opines, never regrets, never is mistaken, never changes his mind, which is like obviously a great idea, right? Like Cicero's just spot on here, right? Yeah, that's that's a terrible idea. Well, one of the authors that I examined, uh, Pseudo Dionysius, says, we offer worship to that which lies hidden, Beyond thought and beyond being, with a wise silence, we do honor to the inexpressible. And so Dionysius here 
who was one of the most apophatic theolo uh, theologians in all history, um, and, and also like one of the most mystical. Um, as, as Pentecostals, you, you probably would enjoy some of what Dionysius says because he's weird, uh, and we're weird, right? Like, I'm Pentecostal, I'm weird, like, let's just own it, right? Like, we do weird stuff. And, and so Dionysius is kind of like there with us, right? Like, he's just, he's just a, a weird dude, like super mystical, super experiential, like, it's, it's interesting. And so from his perspective here, he's like, the height of worship is silence, which kind of gets back to that thing we were talking about earlier where it's like there are times where I think nothing I say is good enough. So what do I do in that situation? I say nothing, right? With a wise silence, I do honor, honor right? Uh, this, is, this is apophaticism, right? But I don't think that this humility should lead to silence, uh, I don't think wisdom is silent, as Cicero believes. I think through the power of the Spirit, we can opine without regret. And we can change our mind when we're mistaken. And so that's, that's what I'm trying to get at in the paper. I think the, the two authors that I um, approach are uh, Dionysius and Gregory of Nazianzus, sometimes also called Gregory the Theologian. Um, these are in the patristic period, and so uh, Dionysius is probably 5th, 6th century. Uh, Gregory is probably, well, Gregory is late 4th, early 5th century. And so they both agree on apophaticism. They both agree on, ultimately, we can't really know God fully in his essence. Right? Like, our abilities fall short. I can't just, like, sit down and think really hard and figure God out. That just, he's, he's well past me, right? <clears throat> they take that in different directions, though. Gregory takes it to revealed knowledge. Dionysius takes it to experience. Those are different solutions to that problem, right? I can't know God, so all I have is my experience. Or, I can't know God, so all I have is what he has said of himself, Right? Like, those are different solutions to that problem. And so the question, I think, is which one should we follow? Uh, and I've kind of tipped my hat already. I think we should follow Gregory. Um, <coughs> the apophatic call to silence results from the realization that our language falls short. Falls short. And so, you know, what do we do with the uh, lack of ability in language? I think we should go with what God has already said. We are unable to know him except that he has made himself known, right? If God has said something about himself, then that thing can be said. Not because of what I know or because of my ability, but because of his, right? Does that make sense? The distinction between me just trying to like figure him out and him saying, this is who I am, right? If he reveals himself, then I can trust his revelation. We're not able to become acceptable to God, except that God has made us acceptable. Uh, Mark McIntosh, who's a Pentecostal theologian, says theological assent is dependent upon the prior descent of God's self-disclosure as the cause of all things. We are likewise unable to adequately pray to God, except that God has made available to us a method of prayer which is efficacious even as our mind is unfruitful. This is a reference to... Uh, Paul's words about speaking in tongues in Corinthians, right? That in the same way that in redemption, we can't reach God by being good. We can't say things about God on our own, right? We can't just like make up beautiful things to say about God that God's like, yeah, that's great. Good job, right? Everything that we do relies on what he's done. Right? including what we say, including what we pray, which I think is a key towards uh, glossolalia. And so at every point, our knowledge of and relationship to God is contingent upon God condescending to us. Now, sometimes people get a little triggered here with the whole notion of condescension, because condescension, condescension is bad between us, right? If I condescend to you, that's kind of like a jerk move, right? You don't want someone to be condescending to you. But God is like legitimately better than us. And so the appropriate disposition between us, uh, us, the appropriate disposition between us, uh, us is condescension, right? If he is legitimately above us, 
then it's actually appropriate for him to be condescending to us. Not in like a weird, like derisive kind of way, but just in an appropriate, like I'm better than you, but I'm not gonna let that get between us, right? <laughs> Yeah. And what about Solomon when he said, Lord, give me wisdom? Yeah. Please. Yeah. So Solomon is recognizing that he doesn't have anything there, right? Like Solomon's recognizing, like, I fall short, right? And so when I say that, like, there's nothing that we can do that God's like, hey, good job. I mean, like, on our own efforts, by our own grit and determination, Right? That doesn't mean that like God isn't pleased when we say or do things. He is. But why is he pleased when we say or do things? Because of what he's done. <laughs> right? Like he's made us acceptable to him. Right? It's not that like he sees my effort and he's like, "You know what? You're better than all these other idiots. Good job." <laughs> right? No, like that's just not how it works, right? When he sees me, he's like, "Because of what Christ has done, you are acceptable to me." Well done, right? It has nothing to do with my effort. It has nothing to do with my ability, right? There's nothing I'm going to be able to do on my own to just sit down and, like, figure it out. And I think Solomon asking for wisdom is, is like that, right? Like, Solomon's like, I don't got this. Can you please help me, right? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, there's an element of, like, you know, your desires to be better, right? Like, did God give him the desire so that God could be pleased with the desire? And, like, you know, we can get into, like, the whole, like, predestination thing, which is kind of tangential to this a little bit. Uh, I'm not a Calvinist. Um, just just so we're all, you know, not triggered. Uh, <laughs> or potentially triggered if you, like, really did Calvinists. Um, um, but, you know, I, th I think at the end of the day, like whether, <laughs> and then everybody looks at, yeah, yeah, sorry, man. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. I was not trying to throw you under the bus. Like, it just happened, right? It just, it just, we got there. I'm sorry. Um, so, yeah. I went to a Calvinist seminary, and Bird is actually uh, kind of like a light Calvinist. Uh, and so, like, I've, I've appreciated a lot, of, uh, a lot of Calvinists. I just don't happen to be one myself. Um, but I think with Solomon, like, whether, like, God gives him that desire, or we want to say that he gives him that desire, like Solomon has the desire himself, that desire itself does not actually create the wisdom. God grants the wisdom, right? So it's not like that desire produces something that is pleasing to God, right? Solomon there is not, like, generating something that is pleasing to God of his own volition, of his own effort, um, and that ultimately, I mean, that's, even as Arminians, even as non-Calvinists, like we have to affirm, there's nothing in us that just by like trying real hard, we can become a pleasing to God. Or we can do something that God's like, hey, you got my attention, good job, right? Like that just doesn't exist. So is that helpful? Yeah, yeah. So uh, likewise, the baptism of the Holy Spirit provides for us the only method by which we can speak mysteries to God. And this is glossolalia, right? This is speaking in tongues. So I think apophatic theology provides us a helpful lens through which we can understand this. Because when we're talking about glossolalia, when we're talking about speaking in tongues, um, there, is, there, there are a lot of different things that can be uh, intended by that, right? We can talk about like uh, prayer in tongues with interpretation, but there's also, it seems textually, prayer in tongues without interpretation that is legitimate, right? <clears throat> and, uh, and this is where I get into fights with, like, my non-Pentecostal friends who are like, you can pray in tongues all you want as long as somebody interprets. And I'm like, in a church context, sure, but there's a lot in the text that seems to say, like, you know, when Paul says, I would that you would all pray in tongues, right? Is he saying, like, I hope you're all in a situation where someone has to interpret what you're saying? Right? Like, that, that doesn't seem to check, right? Like, that doesn't seem, no, that doesn't seem to work. Uh, it, he says, I pray in tongues more than you all. Is he saying, like, 
I'm in a situation really often in church where I have to say Shondala Shondala and then just wait for someone to figure out what that means, right? Like I'm in that situation a lot, more than any of you, right? That just doesn't make sense of the text. And so it seems to be that there is a, a, a phenomenon called, uh, that we could refer to as glossolalia that is uh, speaking in tongues where there is no interpretation, where, where there is some sort of engagement between you and the Spirit where you are praying something and no one else is interpreting, and that that is in some way building you up, right? And the difficult thing in Pentecostalism, I'll get you in just a second, let me finish that, this thought. The difficult thing in Pentecostalism is that there are often things like this that we believe, but then we just never really think about, right? That we're just like, that happens, and the next thing, right? And you're like, but the, like, what is this? Like, what are we doing? Right? And, and so I think glossolalia is one of those things that it's like, we probably should put a little bit more thought into this. Um, I, uh, when I was in Bible college, I got really, really frustrated whenever you'd go like up for a prayer or something and people would like pray for you in tongues. And I'm like, I don't know what you're saying. So this isn't helping me. Right? Like I have like, I'm not super thrilled with you praying in tongues for me right now. Now I'm not saying like, if you pray for People in tongues, like, there's something wrong with that, right? But for me, like, that was just a pet peeve, because I'm like, I'm just going to check out and, like, think about, like, my fantasy football team, right? Because, like, because cause all of what you're saying right now, like, I don't know what's happening, right? Um, and uh, I, there was one night where we had a, a minister at church, or at, at, on campus, who was, like, this crazy prophetic dude that, like, you know, he would just be like on the bus and get words for people, right? Like he's just like one of those guys that just like, and so, so I was like, I, I was going through a lot and I was like, I'm going to go and I'm like, I'm going to get Steve to pray for me because like, because like he hears from the Lord and like, I'm going to get him to pray for me and like, that's going to like fix my issue, right? So I'm sitting there, I'm sitting through the whole service. And I'm like, I'm just waiting for the altar call. I'm going to get Steve to pray for me. And he gets to the altar time and he's like, you know, there's like 400 people here. Uh, all of you know the same Jesus that I know. So if you need prayer, just turn to the person beside you and let them pray for you. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, like dude beside me is just going to pray for me in tongues. And, I'm, it's, and then I'm going to leave and like, it's not going to be worth it, right? So I turn to the guy beside me and I'm like, yeah, I need prayer. And he's like, okay, shandala, shandala, right? Like the whole thing. And as he's praying, my first thought was, see, this is what, this is what I get. And my second thought was, how is it that I understand him? Like literally, like in that moment, God just decided to mess with me and was like, you're frustrated that he's praying for you in tongues? Here's the interpretation. Like, well, thanks. Like, <laughs> now I can't be mad. And so I'm mad that I can't be mad. Like, because I wanted to be right. So, yeah, yeah, it's weird. Anyway, you had a question. <laughs> it, you couldn't even put it into words, right? Like, you couldn't even put it into words. Corinthians 14, because, like, you hear so often, like, we, I was reading a commentary last night, because we were having, actually, a discussion about this exact same subject uh, in, in person and things. And Matthew Henry mm -hmm. talked about how, in, like, the, the Corinthian church, they were just coming, and it was chaotic, and so then yeah. there's the orderly. Yeah. But he basically is saying, like, what you're saying is like it's only when it's edifying to others because like you see on the day of Pentecost that people yeah. speak in tongues and people are able to understand and people come to Christ because they're able to understand right. versus when it's not edifying to someone else right. and so would you say that it should only be happening when it's edifying to someone? Well see I think that's the thing that's fascinating about that passage is that he says the one who prays in tongues edifies himself right? That if there's no interpreter the person praying is edifying themselves, right? So, like, if, if, if Paul was saying, like, you should never do this without an interpreter, why would he say, if you're praying in tongues and no one interprets, you edify yourself? Like, I want to be edified. Shandala, shandala, right? Like, I mean, does that make sense? Like, and so, so I think, you know, in, in a, like, a, a corporate church experience, like, if you're, like, shouting in tongues like someone should interpret that right um but as far as like praying yourself like there is a private prayer language i think 
that Paul's talking about there that if no one's interpreting it, you are edifying yourself, which is really weird because like you don't know what you're saying. So how are you edifying yourself? Like it's just, I, <laughs> right? Like it's weird, right? And that's why I think apophatic theology helps us with this because apophaticism, right? Remember the box? If, if we think about like what's outside the box, God is not hateful, that's still actually an affirmation, right? It's an affirmation of a negative statement. And so we're still saying something about God. So actually the height of, of apophaticism is not even negating things. It's just not saying anything, right? But I, I think even above that is allowing the spirit to give us a way to pray where we don't know what we're saying, but we're, we're saying things that are from God himself, right? Like, it, and, and I think, I legitimately think this is what uh, Romans 8 is talking about, right? The Spirit himself intercedes for us with words that uh, cannot be uttered, and there are people that are like, well, it says it can't be uttered, so they can't be uttered, right? And we're like, no, it, uh, like it's talking about words that are beyond our comprehension, words that are beyond things that we can understand or explain. It's not saying, like, like, what would it even mean that, like, the Spirit is interceding for us with words that can't be said, like, literally can't be pronounced or said? Like, what, where is that happening, right? Like, what kind of language is that, right? Um, and so I think that's what's happening in Romans chapter 8, is that, that when we're praying in the Spirit, something is happening in partnership between our Spirit and the Holy Spirit, where we are saying things that God himself is giving us to say. And so it's the only time that we can say things that are actually really meaningful with regard to God because they're actually from God, right? Um, anyway, I'm like skipping way ahead in this presentation because of your question. But it's a good question. It's a good question. Like this is weird stuff. Yeah. Like, I've only seen one passage, maybe there's more, but I've only seen one passage like, where it talks about how the tongues, um, or it's like the, the language of angels. Yeah. And the other times, like in the book of Acts, it's known languages. Yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. So, so they're they're like when you really get into like the people that do actually think a lot about this, and there's not a lot of them, but there are some. <clears throat> um, um, glossolalia is um, an unknown language. Um, xenolalia um, is a known language that you don't know. And then um, Akualalia is a miracle of hearing where someone's saying one thing but you're hearing something else. This is, this is the distinction that most scholarship makes when it comes to this kind of stuff, right? And I, I would say that Acts chapter two is not actually glossolalia. I would say Acts chapter two is xenolalia, right? Because I don't think they're praying in tongues in the way that we think of praying in tongues. I think they're being given supernaturally the ability to pray in another language without realizing it. And so then you have other people hearing their language, right? And so I think it's, I mean, you could say maybe that's not true. If that's not true, then it's a cool alia, right? They're, they're praying in tongues and the miracles in the hearing, right? Like it's either one of those things. It's not, I don't think it's glossal alia. Like, technically speaking, as far as this distinction is, is concerned. But the difficulty with this is there are some people who refer to all of these things as <laughs> glossolalia, right? <laughs> and they're like, all of that is tongues. And you're like, well, that's helpful, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think that there are, there, there's at least those three distinctions. Um, and there are times, like I've heard stories of people who are like, I know Spanish and I never learned Spanish. Like, the Holy Spirit just gave me Spanish. And I'm like, where was he when I was in seminary, right? Like, I could have used Hebrew, right? Like, that would have been helpful, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, come on, Jesus. Uh, yeah, um, like, that's, that's a thing, right? Earliest, the earliest Pentecostals after Azusa Street thought that tongues was a missionary gift. They thought that you speaking in tongues, God was giving you the language of the people group that you were supposed to go minister, minister to. So they're like, God has now given you the language of that 
people, so go minister to them, go preach in tongues, because you now know that language, right? And there are times where that literally happened, and then there are times where they go to preach in tongues, and everybody's like, I don't know what this person's saying, right? <laughs> like, I don't know, I don't know what's happening right now, <laughs> right? And so, you know, yeah, uh, but that's a good question, yeah. Yeah. Again, I think you're all mad. Yeah. And that's why he sets up. Yeah. You need an interpreter. So how do you go with that specific verse in the sense of like you see it in corporate setting, so everyone yeah. turns to each other in that, that instance and they all start praying in tongues. Yeah. I'm brand new to the church and I just yeah. hear a bunch of people saying a bunch of random things. Right. And it's like how do you, you deal with that specific verse? That was what yeah. coming up in the discussion we had. So this is where like I might be like I am not a professor at some international school of ministry, so, so like, I might, I, there may be some disagreements here, I'm not sure. Um, personally, I think if you're in a corporate setting, like if you're praying in tongues, that should not be at a volume where everybody else can hear it. Because that is, you are edifying yourself and nobody else needs to be involved in that, right? Um, so I'm not overly fond of like the cacophony of tongues in a service where it's like, let's all pray in tongues and you walk in and it's like, blah, 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 like all over the place, you know, like that to me is like, kind of like, uh, unless you just know that this is the kind of service where no one is going to be here, like you're talking about, who's an outsider, who's going to walk in and be like, what is, what is in the water here? Like what, <laughs> right? Like, like, if you know that's the case, that there's not going to be somebody like that, then, like, okay, cool, you know. Like, I've been in chapel services where I work, where it's like, you know, we're praying, and the person leaving the prayer service is like, all right, let's all pray in tongues, right? And I'm like, okay, like, you know. But I, I think also, like, in those instances, like, it's, it's complicated for me, because I know people who, like, really love the Lord, who have prayed for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, who have prayed for speaking in tongues, and have not received it yet. And so, like, that person now feels less than, right? And so it's just, like, really complicated. And so I think we should pray in tongues. I'm very pro-speaking in tongues. But I think the way in which we do it, like, we really just need to be careful because of outsiders, because of people who don't pray in tongues, because of people who are trying to pray in tongues and haven't gotten there yet. Like, we just have to be careful how we implement that. Right now, I very well may have like offended a whole lot of people just now. I'm sorry. Right, we can disagree about this. It's okay, um, but uh, but that's that's where I stand. Like I'm kind of like I'm kind of a moderate when it comes to this. Like I think we should pray in tongues, but like also let's 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 try to not be weird when we can manage to not be weird. Right, because we're weird enough. We, like we let's just not go out of our way to be that. Right. Um, I saw a hand over here a second ago. Yeah, you're good? Okay, cool. Um, so, um, trying to get to like actual, like the two people that I'm talking about here and I'm, it's not gonna happen. Um, so, so, <coughs> what's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have a student who gives me a hard time every class. She's like, the title slide doesn't count. How many slides are we getting through today? And I'm like, three, four? Like, I don't, I don't know, I don't know. Um, so, we already talked a little bit about uh, this first quote, right, that uh, instead of listing what God is or who God is, uh, we talk about what God is not. Um, this is a helpful quote to think through, though. This is an a Eastern Orthodox theologian, Vladimir Milosky, and he says, All knowledge has as its object that which is. Now, God is beyond all that exists. In order to approach him, it is necessary to deny all that is inferior to him, that is to say, all that which is. So what he's saying here is that, like, you can't affirm or deny anything. Like, there's nothing you can say about God, right? Now, I'm, I don't agree with Lasky, but this is, like, a hardcore approach to apophaticism, right? That, like, we don't, we don't know God, right? Um, and, and from Lasky's perspective, he's talking about the imminent trinity. He's like, we can talk about what God, what God does all day long, right? We can talk about this all day long, but you can't get over here, right? That's Lasky's perspective, right? You just can't get this ever, period. You don't know it, right? I, don't, I, I can't get that far, right? Because I think there has to be a meaningful link between these two things, 
right? Otherwise, God's just messing with us, right? Uh, but that's that's hardcore apophaticism. That's that's Lasky, right? Um, and he's he's an excellent theologian, really great uh, great person to to read and uh, think through. Um, let me skip through a couple of these so we can get to actual like Dionysius and Gregory real quick. Um, yeah, so uh, Dionysius is really really hard to understand. Um, really, really hard to understand, but he is one of the most important theologians in the church's history. Um, Thomas Aquinas, who is probably like top five, maybe even top three uh, theologians in the history of the church, quoted Dionysius more than anyone else, right? Uh, and Thomas Aquinas is a big deal. So Dionysius is a big deal. Um, and so we have this quote here, the third bullet point down, except for the Bible and perhaps the works of Boethius, who's another important theologian in the early church, no writing of the early Christian era received similar attention in terms of translations, excerpts, commentaries, and even cumulative corpora that combined these elements into variable, uh, veritable encyclopedias of Dionysian scholarship. But Dionysius is super weird. Like, he's, he's super weird. Let me show you, um, show you a quote from him, right? Oh, okay. Dude, dude, I'm hot right now. So like, I was hoping you were going in the other direction. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, so this is, this is a quote from Dionysius. He says, what has actually to be said about the cause of everything is this. Since it is the cause of all beings, we should posit and ascribe to it all the affirmations we, we make in regard to beings. And more appropriately, we should negate all of these affirmations since it surpasses all being. Right? So he's saying we should engage in Codifoticism, but also in apophaticism, right? We should affirm all things, but then deny all things, right? This is where Lasky gets his notion that, like, we can't, we can't get here, right? We can't get here. Nothing that we say of God has any meaning for Lasky, right? And he's following Dionysius. And the point that I, you know, we're running out of time here because of questions. Thanks, guys. Uh, <clears throat> the point that I'm trying to get at with the comparison between Dionysius and Gregory <clears throat> um, and if you guys want to like nerd out on this more, um, Nick has the paper that I wrote, and so he can he can pass it along to you. Is Pentecostals tend to follow Dionysius? Pentecostals tend to follow Dionysius in saying, "I can't know anything of God, so all I have is my experience." Right? And I'm not I'm not anti-experience, right? I'm not. I mean, we we talked about all the weird stuff, right? Like so, like yay, experience, right? all about it. But experience is not authoritative, right? Experience is not authoritative. I really like Wesley on this, right? The Wesleyan quadrilateral, you guys know that? Uh, uh, scripture, reason, tradition, and experience. All of those things have to be brought to bear, right? You have a question or are you just stretching? Um, yeah. I can't tell. Uh, like what Yeah, so that's a problem with Dionysius, right? That's a problem with Dionysius is because your experience is absolutely like in cultural context, right? And so there are things that you're going to understand in your experience through the lens of your experience that other people wouldn't necessarily get. And that may be a good thing, but that may not be a good thing, right? And Dionysius doesn't really account for that, right? Your experience isn't authoritative. Like it's important right? Let's be Pentecostal, like experience is important, but it's not authoritative, right? This is the problem. Gregory, on the other hand, Gregory, uh, I've got one quote that I just absolutely have to show uh, of, of Gregory that's just, it's fantastic, okay? Uh, this, is, this is Gregory's response to people like Dionysius. He, they weren't at this writing at the same time, so he wasn't writing about Dionysius himself, but this is his response to the apophatic approach. He says, the person who tells you what God is not, but fails to tell you what he is, is rather like someone who asks what two times five is, answers not two, not three, not four, not five, not 20, not 30, 
No number, in short, under 10 or over 10. He does not deny that it is 10, but he is also not settling the questioner's mind with a firm answer. It's much simpler, much briefer, to indicate all that something is not by indicating what it is than to reveal what it is by denying what it is not. Right? Now, you would, you would expect that this person is not a fan of apophaticism, right? Because he's outright mocking it here, right? But he actually engages in apophaticism pretty regularly. He actually says, like, we don't really know God that well, right? Crossing this bridge from what God does to who God is is not just simple, right? It's not something that we can just, like, push real hard and get there, right? But he also balances, this is why I like Gregory as opposed to Dionysius, because he's like, look, like, we can say things, right? Like, we can say things. And ultimately, for Gregory, the point of theology is that, that God has revealed himself, right? Um, and this, this is a quote from uh, Pelican. Let me get back to uh, another one by Gregory. Uh, you know, well, here's an example of him being apophatic, right? To know God is hard, to describe him is impossible. No, actually, to tell of God is not possible, but to know him is even less possible, right? It's the same guy, right? And he's talking about crossing this bridge from what, what God has done, who God has revealed himself to be, to who God is in his essence. Getting over here is really hard because God is so far beyond us, right? And so how do we get here? We don't. Jesus gets here, right? Like that's the important, I mean, that's, that's, that's why this distinction, this is why like the apophotic codophotic distinction is actually really important in theology because you can't just figure God out, right? This is one of the problems with deconstruction, right? If I could just get on a soapbox for a second. If you're gonna delete all of your beliefs and then just like build them back up, who do you think you are that you're gonna figure out the mysteries of the universe by just thinking hard, right? Like, what? <laughs> like, that's, no, no one has ever done that. Like, that just doesn't work, right? You don't just delete all of your beliefs and then just try to figure it out, right? That's not how this works, right? And so you, you can't cross this bridge, but Jesus has crossed this bridge. He has made himself like us so that we can understand who he is, right? And this, to me, is, it, it is the paradigm for tongues, Right? This is the paradigm for tongues. When you get to a point where you don't feel, I mean, we've all been there, right? We've all been there in worship where we're like, I don't feel like there's anything that I can say. Right? I just, you're so great. You're so big. You're so far beyond anything that I could even imagine. I, what am I going to say that is going to add to your existence? It's just not worth it. Right? We've all been there, right? And in those instances, you can either be silent or because, the, because God loves us and has crossed that bridge for us, the Holy Spirit gives us an opportunity in the moment when our deepest felt need is to be able to say something, but we don't feel like we can, the Holy Spirit in tongues allows us to say things that are actually meaningful, right? It, he, he's giving you a way to do the thing that you feel like you need to do, but you feel like you can't, right? Does that make sense? Like, because what God says about himself is true. And so if the Spirit gives you the words, the Spirit is authorized to say things about God that are true, even if you're not. So in tongues... In that experience of tongues, the personal pr private prayer language, right? Um, which, you know, xenolalia, glossolalia, coolalia, all the lalias, right? Uh, glossolalia, right? Private prayer language. In that version, the spirit and your spirit are partnering, and God himself is giving you language so that you don't have to feel that, like, I'm not good enough. I can't say anything, Right? Um, and th this for me really, like, really transformed worship because I, I get to that spot a lot where I'm like, man, there's nothing I can say, right? That's where Shondala Shondala helps out, right? Right? Like that, I mean, it takes over, right? Like that gives me the vehicle to be like, I, I, I am now, I'm just going to use your words, 
because that's all I've that that's all that's that's meaningful. This is also why I'm not. Uh, this is also why I like scripted prayer. This is also why I like praying scripture because it actually fills the same role, right? Uh, one of the things that I memorized in, when I took Hebrew was uh, um, Deuteronomy six four, the Shema: Hear, O Israel, Lord's God, God is one. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Uh, and we, we memorized like a, a liturgical line that's after that. That's Baruch Shem Kavod Malchuto Olam Va'ed. And uh, it's blessed be your glorious name, your kingdom endures forever. Um, and those two lines, like, you know, if I'm not feeling like Shandala Shandala, right? Like that's something that I can say that when I don't know what else to say, like I say what he has said, right? Um, because his words are meaningful even when mine aren't. Right? Any other questions? We're like almost out of time. Any other questions about any of this? From our Calvinist friend. I'm just kidding, man. I'm just kidding. It's it's from a place it's from a place of love, man. It's from a place of love, right? I, I I'm sorry for outing you earlier. That was that was not cool. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Are you you just stretching now. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So when we get to heaven, are we all going to be speaking in tongues? Oh, that's a great question. I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea, right? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, um, I, I, I don't think it's going to be tongues, uh, but I also don't think it's going to be Hebrew. Uh, I don't know if we're just going to have a cool alia where we can just understand each other, right? I. Right. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff like that about like future eternity where it's like, there's just not like Paul doesn't have a passage where he's like, here's how it's going to work y'all. Right. Like that just isn't a thing. And so, uh, so we, we can try to figure it out based on, you know, various different things, but I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what that's going to look like. So yeah. Okay. So I'm probably using a bit too much. No, 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 that's a good question. I don't think that that's the case, but, but I mean, that's absolutely a great question. That's, that's a great, uh, you know, great thought experiment. I don't, I don't think that when we get to heaven, we're going to be speaking in tongues, but I do think that the purpose of redemption is to get us back to Eden, right? I mean, there are a lot of, from a biblical theological perspective, like there's just a lot of stuff where God's trying to bring it back to what it was supposed to be. And so I think that's one of the reasons why, like, saying that we're going to speak in tongues is kind of like, I'm not sure about that. Because tongues really, from like a biblical theological standpoint, is a reversal of Babel, not a reversal of the fall, right? Because we all build the Tower of Babel, and we're like, we're going to manipulate God to do what we want him to do. Um, and, uh, and then we scatter, and there's a bunch of different languages. And then Acts chapter 2 is the opposite of that, right? All of the different languages come together, and they understand each other as opposed to one language getting scattered so that they don't understand each other. Um, and so I think tongues is a reversal of Babel, not a reversal of the fall. But, I mean, again, like, what do I know, right? I could be wrong. So, <laughs> but that's a good thought. Like, that's a good, good train of thought. Yeah. Mm. Whether you should really, because obviously you should use the Bible more than you use your own testimony. Yeah. Would, could we use this as a way of like saying, hey, you know, your preaching should be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe I, I'm not super uh, optimistic about that uh, because I'm not sure if that kind of debate gets solved like this side of eternity um, because there. People have their preaching style that they're sort of just like, this is the way I do things. 
and like getting somebody to change their mind on that is n is not a simple thing, right? It's like getting somebody to change their mind on speaking in tongues, right? Like let's all go have a conversation with John MacArthur, right? Like it ain't gonna go well, right? Like uh, and uh, I mean I have I have like I actually have friends who teach at his seminary, who like I have profited from to great extent, right? William Varner teaches Greek at his seminary, and William Varner is a genius, and I love that guy, but, you know, he thinks I'm demon-possessed because I speak in tongues, right? <laughs> and so, uh, you know, it's like, you know, yeah, so changing people's minds on that stuff, like, I don't know that that's, I don't know that's, that that's going to happen, um, but I do think as Pentecostals, this is like one of those areas that we shouldn't just do things, right? We should think through them, right? Uh, I mean, think about, like, try to, like, fast forward and think through, like, you know, when you have kids, like, how are you going to explain tongues to your kids, right? <laughs> Did you have, do you have a story about that? At least, three. at least three, at least three, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, but it's not a simple thing, right? Like, it's not like this, like, here's how, I'm sorry? There you go, there you go, yeah, yeah. There are worse things to be than a Presbyterian, right? There are. So, yeah, um, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's not a simple thing, right? And when you have kids, they're going to ask you questions. And what do you say to that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't that mean, wouldn't that be like blaspheming the Holy Ghost? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, MacArthur's, uh, MacArthur's most recent book about charismatics like, and, and I, I have a lot of respect for MacArthur, but his most recent book about charismatics is, is one of the worst books written on any theology ever in the history of humanity. It's terrible. It's terrible. Because, because he, he says um, that we're blaspheming the Holy Spirit by attributing the works of Satan to the Holy Spirit. But if you read the text, that is not blaspheming the Holy Spirit. In the text, blaspheming the Holy Spirit is attributing the works of the Holy Spirit to Satan, which is precisely what his book is doing. So, like, if he's right, no one is blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And if he's wrong, he's blaspheming the Holy Spirit. But in no scenario are we blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And so it's just like, bro, like, you need to sit down in my exegesis class. Like, you, that's bad. That's real bad. Right? Like, that's real bad. And I, I have a lot of respect for him. Like I said, William Varner, phenomenal. Right? But that book, I mean, it just, to me, it just screams that he has an axe to grind. And he's in this echo chamber of people that don't like charismatic or Pentecostal theologians. And, and there are lots of really solid Pentecostal charismatic theologians who, when he wrote that, were like, would you like to sit down and talk about this? And he's like, no, nah, I'm good. And you're like... <laughs> Yeah, like Craig Keener is like not even human anymore. Like that guy is like a machine. And and he's like, let's talk. And John MacArthur is like, no, I'm good. And you're like, okay, cool. Cool, bud. Cool. Which isn't to say that like he, you know, he's he's a smart guy, but like, you know, any of us could end up in this place where we're in an echo chamber and we have an axe to grind and we end up like, you know, just making fun of, you know, whoever. And uh, we can all get there. Right? That's why we need voices to, you know, confront us and yeah. Anyway. I'm sorry. We really do need to stop because the next class starts in five minutes. All right. <laughs>